Uh, so we are recording now. Hopefully everybody can see uh, the screen. If for some reason you're having any issues or um, you know, you're not able to hear me or you feel like I'm not able to hear you, uh, please go ahead and use that chat box to let us know uh, if there are any problems. But thank you all for joining us. This is the DC Oral History Collaborative Partnership Grants webinar. Um, I do apologize for the inconvenience. This session was scheduled to take place in person at the Anacostia Library, uh, but due to a scheduling error, uh, we were not able to do it in um, the meeting room there tonight. So uh, we made this switch, and I um, you know, greatly appreciate um, the group from Anacostia uh, Library joining us. Uh, nevertheless, so hopefully we'll be able to, um, you know, convey all the same information, answer all the same questions. Uh, we'll just do it in this kind of remote format. Um, so to start with, um, the DC Oral History Collaborative, as some of you on the webinar might know, is a uh, partnership between Humanities DC, the Historical Society of Washington DC, and the DC Public Library. Uh, it's a program that has been going on now since 2017, so this is the fourth year of the project. Uh, it has several components. Uh, the grants program, of course, which is what we're interested in tonight, but it also has a volunteer training component, and it also has a component where we survey existing oral history collections that are about Washington, D.C. We can talk a little bit more about those other two components towards the end of the webinar as well. Um, so, um, you know, to start with, um, what we usually like to do, and hopefully we can do this relatively quickly, is just give everybody who is on the call right now, and that includes everybody who's part of that group, the Anacostia Library, a chance to just tell us who you are and uh, just a couple sentences about a project that you might be interested in and uh, you know maybe how you got interested in that. Um, so um, I can just go down the attendees list as we have it here. Um, I see that Beverly Lindsay Johnson is on. Beverly, would you like to start out by uh, just telling us a little bit um, about who you are and the project that you're interested in working on. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Beverly Lindsay Johnson, and I'm calling on behalf of the National Hand Dance Association. And um, I was a part of the initial uh, oral history collaborative, the volunteers. So, um, and th that was a great experience. And um, what the National Hand Dance Association wants to do, or should I say that, you know, just give a little idea of why I'm, you know, why I'm on the webinar. Yeah, if you can just give a couple sentences about the project that you're thinking about doing this year for the oral history collaborative. Okay. Um, for about 10 years, the National Hand Dance Association has been archiving the history of hand dance. Um, and hand dance is the official dance of the District of Columbia. And so um, it's, you know, it evolved, it has been around for 60 years and it has evolved over generations. And so we have uh, started an archival project about 10 years ago where we collected oral histories from the various generations of hand dance. And so we would like to, we, we kind of stopped for a minute and we'd like to pick that back up and go to the next generation of hand dancers, which, are, which is a younger uh, community of, of, um, uh, uh, of young people who have taken hand dance and made it their own. So we want to do an oral history with them. They started when they were teenagers. We have one who started hand dancing when she was eight years old. And so now they are in their 20s and 30s. And so we want to get their history. So that's what our project is. Great, thanks Beverly. Uh, if we can just go back real quick to the Anacostia Library group, if you all feel like, uh, you know, you can do that. Um, um, I know you're kind of crowding around a laptop right now, but if you wouldn't mind just quickly introducing yourselves and letting us know a couple sentences about a project that you might want to do. Yeah, my name is Chauncey Harrison, born in Southeast, raised in Southeast, 
All I know, I can tell you so much history about Southeast, where I was raised up at. I was raised up, we didn't have sidewalks out here. We didn't have um, a different school. Um, I know that Southeast, when we lived here in Southeast, this has been years ago. I'm 83 now. And uh, what happened was, uh, I was, I used to go to Emmanuel Baptist Church, which is on a food place right now, Angel Place. Uh, I've been suit and parkway. I used to ride horses up and down there. There was no suit and parkway when I came along. It was an old clay road. And there was a Lem Street bridge. It was a draw bridge, an old wooden bridge. It was not, nothing like it is this day and time. We had to do a lot of walking. Right here on any place, there's a wreck on it, and it's still there. It used to be the project that has been there for years and years. And I used to we have to walk over there, go through the woods. We had to do a lot of walking, but we didn't have transportation uh, at the time that I was, I was coming up out uh, southeast. Uh, we had, like I said, we had outhouses. I had to, we had horse trails, so I had to take my horse up to the trails on the Bruce Blades, and uh, we had hydrogen, pump hydrogen. We had to pump water uh, to get water to our house. We had to take water and uh, down to the house, heat the water in order to take a bath. We had to get in a tin tub to take a bath. <laughs> so tell me what's your project? Oh, my project? Yeah. My project is trying to get a dream to so I can do the history. Uh, a lot of people say they're from uh, Southeast from, or from Washington, which they don't know. If you don't go back to the 30s, you don't know nothing about Southeast. Because it's changed so much. Thank you, Dad. That was good. Who's next? Right. Um, uh, I can go. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Davis. Um, I guess uh, I'm the project I'm particularly interested in is um, particularly because there's so many mass movements and mass protests that have been going on in recent times, um, both around the world and in America, um, with like the resistance marches. Um, one protest that I was very interested in getting an oral history of was the um, protests in the lead up to the Iraq War uh, here in DC, um, because in the months preceding that, um, the single largest protest in the world happened in, I believe, uh, February of 2003, um, with over, I think it was over 800 cities participating and something like 100,000 people marching in DC. And because um, these sort of mass protests are becoming more frequent and more influential, they're bringing down governments, um, forcing changes. I wanted to chart kind of and um, interview the people who both were protesting, possibly policymakers, people who um, might have reacted to it, and those who clearly didn't because the war happened, um, about what effect um, it might have had, um, what sort of things um, did or didn't happen that otherwise um, might have produced a different outcome in terms of whether the United States went to war with Iraq. Um, because it's, it's, I mean, these kind of protest movements, I think there's probably not all that much written so much as about people's experiences, what they saw and heard. Um, and so much of it is, you know, that many people, it's, you know, so many people around DC. Um, I think it'd be an interesting insight into um, both the politics in DC as well as the people who lived here, why they reacted like that, and why, um, why it wasn't successful in this kind of era of more and more mass protest. Very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm uh, my name is Craig uh, Bell, and um, I'm, I, I just found out about this today, um, but I, I work with a tour guide company in DC and, and one of my tour guides, he uh, told me about this experience and he thought it would be a good idea for me. I, I currently have a, a website that's about East of the Anacostia River and it's always been my intention to um, um, be a mouthpiece, if you will, about the history here. And um, typically when people refer to this area, it's always in a negative connotation. And so my my mission, my passion is to constantly 
um, show our historical uh, relevance. And um, I read a lot, you know, research and things like that, but nothing beats the word of mouth. So I, I you know, right now I, I want to do some oral interviews with people like this gentleman sitting across from me <laughs> on what it was like that, that, that you can't find in any history book. Um, that's, that's my thing. Very cool. Well, hi, I'm Gwendolyn Harrison Hubbard, and I'm here with my in support of my husband and my daughter in collecting um, the original versions, <laughs> as my husband puts it, that so much of the history is left out. So I'm here to assist in that manner, and I've heard this on the radio. Uh, I think it was last year, and I contacted my daughter. I said, this matches right up with what you and dad are, have been working on. And, and so it, it, it's a great fit, and it's a perfect opportunity to document more of history from D.C., Southeast. Very cool. Hi, I'm Lisa Dunn. I'm the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and um, I'm here with my mom and dad, and I am basically um, making a documentary about um, Washington from the perspective of a 83-year-old native, who is my dad. Um, I do it first to um, keep my dad active and young. <laughs> he just stopped taking plumbing jobs two years ago, maybe, <laughs> when he was 81. So he doesn't know what retirement looks like. And I endeavor that he doesn't know what it looks like. Slide. <laughs> so um, I was happy that my mom shared this information with us. I think we tried to get in around May um, of this year, and we and we missed it. So um, hopefully uh, we're at one point for this time. Great, thank you. Is there anybody that's else okay. there that's uh, joined in? Nope, that's it. That's it. All right. Well, I th thank you very much again for joining us, even you know, with the kind of strange circumstances there. I really appreciate you all kind of gathering together and making this work for us. Um, it looks like uh, next on the list, uh, Kelvin, do you want to talk a little bit about your project? I can't quite hear you, Kelvin. I can't hear him either. No, we can't either. Yeah. yeah, it seems like there might be some technical difficulties there. We might have to we have to come back to you a little bit later, Kelvin, if that's okay. Uh, Paul, Paul, are you able to talk to us a little bit about uh, your project? Sure. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to, I guess, uh, introduce Tracy as well. We're Paul and Tracy Grant. Uh, we're producers here uh, in D.C. Uh, we own a small production company called Ascender Films or Ascender Communications. And we are, are in the process of, of developing oral histories on our community, our neighborhood in Southeast DC, which is Penn Branch. It's a community of about 550 single family homes in Southeast Washington. And it was integrated in the early, probably in the early 1960s. And many of those residents, those first African-American residents who integrated this community are now in their 80s and 90s and we're starting to lose them. And a new generation has come in. We just like to collect an oral history of, of the community that could, uh, be preserved in a formal way. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Sumaya, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, maybe a couple of the projects that you're thinking of? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Well, um, last year uh, when when I tried to apply, I was talking about. Um, uh, talk uh, commemorating Calorama Road experience, but this year um, I want to be able to hone in on my neighborhood, which is Petworth. Um, I grew up in the Petworth area, 
And um, the home that I grew up in has been totally facelifted. Um, and I want to call it the new house on the block. But what I would like to do is talk about the good memories that I had in that home and try to research my neighbors that grew up with me during the same period, which would um, satisfy the requirement of interviews and then put this, these interviews in a formal format, in a format that could be used um, uh, by others to, to learn about growing up in DC. Um, I did attend other uh, meetings and I did say that <clears throat> I am a third generation Washingtonian where my grandmother was born here. And so I would really like to record um, my memories, my fond memories of growing up in DC. Great, thanks, Shamaya. Uh, and I also want to introduce uh, Maggie Lemire, who is on the call right now. Um, Maggie is the consulting oral history oral historian and the community outreach coordinator for the DC Oral History Collaborative. Um, so um, I think you know one thing to kind of start with. Then we'll go to the first slide, and um, I'll let Maggie introduce herself, her role, and uh, to you know help us figure out a little bit more about what we mean when we are talking about oral history within the context of the DC Oral History Collaborative. Is that all right, Maggie? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, hi, everyone. Lovely to meet you um, and hear you at least. Um, hopefully meet you in person since it didn't work out which night at another point. I really appreciate you being on the call as Jasper also said. Um, so yeah, I am an oral historian. I've been doing oral history for about 15 years and I've helped um, start the DC Oral History Collaborative with Jasper. And my job is once people get grants, I help support you through your entire grantee experience to make sure that you can be successful. Um, so we have some required trainings across three different weeks in March so that everyone gets to know each other. As you can hear, there's an amazing group of people telling stories in DC. So we bring you together and we um, kind of delve into how to do oral history interviews, how to use your recorders, how to process them, look at them archived. And, if you have challenges throughout the process, I'm kind of your cheerleader and your support person. Um, but before we get to that point, I also help people apply for the grants. And so my hope is that after today, if you decide you want to move forward with an application um, and you want some feedback on your idea or you even want me to look at a draft, that you'll know that um, I'm happy to talk to you on the phone and read things. Um, and basically try to help people who have a story to tell, um, no matter if you're a professional oral historian or not, uh, know that this is completely within uh, the possibilities for you and, and help you be successful. Um, so transitioning from a little bit about me to what is oral history, um, essentially I just say it's, it's really just the art of having a really great conversation and it's deep listening. So it's sort of the anti soundbite culture. Um, we're really looking to allow people to tell their stories in the fullness and complexity, um, the contradiction um, that they feel honors them. And so as oral historians, we really practice t helping people tell the story from their point of view um, and knowing how to do that in a way that creates a space um, or really authentic and important stories to emerge that are not just like the uh, the CV lines. Um, sorry, now my dog is barking. <laughs> um, and oral history interviews are usually about two hours long. Is important to know just in terms of um, what we're looking for when we talk about oral history today. Is that good, Jasper? Do you think that's what we can talk about? No, that's great. Yep. That sounds good. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, the uh, basic info about the grants, uh, there's actually three potential programs. We've got a couple of them outlined here on the slide. The first one's for uh, new oral history projects. So that would mean, you know, if you're just starting uh, 
an inquiry, if you're just starting to develop a list of narrators and you want a, a funding to do a new oral history project, uh, that's the one that you would want to go for. The award is up to $7,000. Um, just some of the, um, and we'll go through um, the application within the grants portal, but you know, some of the things you'll have to have is uh, a theme focus or a research question you're going to illuminate by doing this oral history project. Uh, there's a requirement that all new projects interview a minimum of five people. Um, and, you know, in some ways, we don't actually want you to go too far above that either, because as you'll find out, there's a lot that goes into uh, not just recording these oral histories, but there's a lot of documentation, kind of supporting materials that go along with them. So um, it is, uh, it can be a challenge to fit too many of these oral history interviews into a single grant period. Uh, so it's a minimum of five, but you probably don't want to go too much higher than that either. Um, and yeah, just to elaborate on that, final final product will actually be the documented recordings, including uh, transcripts for each one of the oral history interviews, legal release forms. Uh, there's a, a good deal of metadata, and that's basically descriptions of the interviews, biographical information, information about the locations that are referenced in those oral history interviews. Um, and you'll need timestamp indexes and photographs of the interviewee. So as you can see, it's you know, not just a matter of recording the oral histories, but there's a lot of uh, additional documentation. Uh, there's a whole process that goes along with it as well. So it is quite the undertaking. Um, the other, uh, the, the, next, the next grant to talk about is for public projects and events. Sometimes we call this the interpretation grant. And the key thing to remember about this grant is that it's not for collecting new oral histories. That's the new oral histories project, new oral history projects grant. The Public Projects and Events Grant is for uh, projects that take existing oral histories from the archives, and that can be through institutional archives. It can be existing oral history collections that may be in privately held archives, uh, as long as they adhere to the standards of you know, what we're looking for when we say oral histories. Um, but it takes those oral histories out of those archives and creates public projects uh, using them, kind of um, directly use the narrator's voices in those oral history projects. So uh, just some um, you know, ideas for what that might look like. Um, we actually launched this program last year and we had a grantee create a uh, playback theater performing arts piece based on oral histories that he had collected over a number of years. We had a couple of teachers teaching in DC schools who created a curriculum for uh, ninth through 12th graders that use uh, oral histories from throughout, uh, collections across the city to you know, produce this um, educational curriculum that can now be shared with other uh, educators across the city and beyond. Um, we've had people uh, create documentary films with existing oral history collections. So there's not really a prescription here about what sort of projects that you'll create as long as um, you're you know, kind of honoring those oral histories, bringing them out of the archives, and making those uh, narrator's voices accessible to the general public. Um, <clears throat> the uh, projects uh, that are selected for the public projects and events grant all do have to produce some final tangible product. So whether it's a film, whether it's uh, you know PDFs of exhibit panels, whether it's some sort of finding guide, whatever it might be, uh, there has to be some sort of uh, final product that can be added to. Humanities DC's DC Digital Museum, our online digital archive. Uh, the max award for that is up to $12,000. Uh, the third grant that's not up here is the extension grant. Um, and um, it looks like there might be a couple people on the call who would qualify for the extension grant, but that one is actually only open to grantees who have previously uh, been awarded a DC Oral History Collaborative New Oral, Histories, New Oral History Project grant and completed and closed out that grant successfully. So that grant is really for extensions of projects that have already taken place through the DC Oral History Collaborative. Um, all grant proposals for all three programs are due uh, by midnight on January 10th. Uh, so that deadline is coming up fairly quickly. Um, a little bit more information about um, you know several of the opportunities here. I've, try to denote where it applies to the new projects versus the public projects. But um, generally, uh, we view these grants as more of a partnership than solely a funding opportunity. And part of that, as Maggie was mentioning, is that she's very involved in um, 
training, coaching, mentoring everyone who receives one of these grants. And in that way, uh, we really try to make it so that, you know, you don't have to be a, you know, expert or a historian. You don't have to have a lot of background or experience. Um, you know, anyone who's interested in preserving these stories, um, you know, making sure that uh, the memories of their neighborhoods and their communities live on, have access to this funding, have access to uh, the DC Oral History Collaborative. So, um, you know, we do work with all the project directors pretty closely throughout the grant period. Um, in keeping with that, the project directors uh, who are awarded the new projects grant are all required to attend a three session workshop at the very start of the grant. And we already know now that those workshop dates are March 12th, March 19th, and March 26th. So as you're thinking about applying for the New Oral History Projects grant, you wanna make sure to keep those dates open. And all the grants workshops are in the evening, they're 5.30 to 8.30, um, and uh, they're, you know, they're basically one a week. But project directors uh, or a representative from the um, organization who's going to be involved in the interviewing has to attend all three sessions in order to qualify for the funding. So that's definitely something to keep in mind if you're applying. Uh, there will also be scheduled check-ins with Maggie um, or other DCOHC support consultants or staff. Um, there will be opportunities to share the work that you've done, progress updates. One of the big things that we're trying to cultivate here with the DC Oral History Collaborative here is a sense of a cohort that everybody is kind of supporting one another. They're sharing what works and what doesn't. Uh, so that everybody's projects can be successful at, by the end of the grant period. Uh, another key aspect is that all interviews that are collected through the DCOHC will be considered for accession into the DC Public Library Special Collections. Uh, that's a key consideration because a lot of that documentation that we talked about is directly related to making sure that the oral histories that you collect are available online through the DCPL Special Collections. Uh, that is the ultimate goal for all of this, is that um, uh, all, all the interviews that you all would be collecting would be uh, made broadly available to researchers, educators, students, anyone who's interested in DC history. Um, and then finally, um, the expectation is that partners will work with DCOHC around uh, overall outreach. So, you know, we want people to know about DCOHC. We want people to know about your projects as they're being developed. And, you know, of course, we want to um, you know, support any efforts to share back uh, the work that you've done with your communities and with uh, DC, uh, the general public, uh, you know, overall. So there are a couple more things. Um, the uh, DCOHC grants are uh, definitely open to organizations, 501c3 nonprofit organizations, but this is a grant opportunity that is also open to individuals. Uh, I always try to steer people a little bit towards um, applying through a 501c3 nonprofit organization because sometimes, especially um, in terms of uh, like tax issues and things like that, it's easier to apply through a nonprofit. Uh, if you apply through a nonprofit, a lot of times you'll get a lot of additional support for your project that you wouldn't get if you were working uh, as an individual on your own, um, but it is open to both individuals and nonprofit organizations. Um, Another difference um, kind of with uh, some of our other, some of Humanities DC's other grant programs is that the new projects grant and the extension grants do not require a Humanities Scholar. Uh, all other Humanities DC grants and the DCOHC public projects grants do. Now that Humanities Scholar does not have to be a credentialed scholar. It doesn't have to be somebody working in an academic setting. It just has to be somebody who is verifiably an expert on whatever sort of project you're producing. So if it's somebody who just, you know, happens to be able to demonstrate a depth of knowledge about the community or the neighborhood um, about which you're doing an oral history, that person can more than qualify to be your humanities scholar. You just need to make a case for them to the uh, evaluation panels. All right. And so a couple um, additional requirements, I already talked about a few of these uh, for the new projects grant. Uh, there is that uh, requirement that you'll attend the three workshop sessions, that you'll have a theme, focus, or research question that you're gonna put into the application, minimum of five people interviewed. Uh, there's also a question on the application, which we'll go over that um, talks about how you will uh, engage with the communities. 
that you're going to be or you're going to be interviewing that you'll be doing your oral history with, um, and that's not just engaging with them within the interviews, but also in the overall design and implementation of the project. Um, and again, that final product will be not only the recordings that you produce, but all the documentation that goes along with it for the DC Public Library. Uh, before I move on, are there any questions? I see that um, there is one question that Kelvin has put into the chat box. Uh, asking to repeat um, about the information about the Humanities Scholar. Uh, again, the Humanities Scholar is only required for the uh, public projects and events grant. Um, the Humanities Scholar is somebody who has a depth of knowledge about the area of inquiry that the project would be about. So, um, you know, if you're doing a documentary film about a particular neighborhood based on a set of oral histories, you would just need to be able to um, indicate uh, through what you put in the application, through that person's resume, that they do have that background, that knowledge to serve as the humanities scholar on the project. But, you know, I'll reiterate that that person does not have to have any particular credentials. They don't have to, you know, have a PhD in history. They don't have to have extensive background even, you know, in interviewing. They just need to be able to, like, provide that kind of um, uh, knowledge support on the project topic and also be able to create some sort of context for it within the larger humanities field. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Kelvin. Does anybody else have any other questions so far? Hi, this is Gwen. Uh, yep. I'm wondering if the slide would be available. Uh, could it be emailed to us? Yes, uh, we can definitely do that. Um, you know, one thing that I've asked people to do in the past is um, if you could uh, um, well, well, actually, one thing that you can do is you can, uh, there's a contact slide at the end with my email address. So one thing you could do is just email me to request the link. Um, right. Another thing that you could do um, is if you just want to put your email address into the chat box, I can collect them that way as well. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on. Um, here's a couple ideas uh, for sample project types, um, you know, either for a uh, oral history project that you want to do or for, again, that kind of public projects, events, interpretation grant. Um, you know, we've received ap applications for people who are doing, you know, projects that are around a particular cause, movement, other activity. Um, Davis, it sounds like your project idea would kind of fit within that category. Uh, we've had applications for neighborhood studies. Uh, people who are looking at labor history or trying to, you know, bring together groups of narrators who are present during particular time periods or historic events. Uh, this is a, you know, obviously like not fully inclusive list. Uh, you know, we would welcome people who are thinking outside of these lines, um, but these are just some, some kind of ideas to help spark your creativity. Um, there are a few ideas here for the public projects. We talked about documentary films. We talked about curricula. But, you know, it could also be things like um, exhibits, it could be listening stations, it could be publications, it could be digital humanities projects. Uh, again, there's no kind of constraints on this. Um, you know, we're looking for people to be innovative and creative in the way they get these stories out to the public. Um, here are some basic eligibility requirements. Um, it's a little bit different between, uh, you know, depending on whether or not you're applying as a organization or an individual. Uh, organizations have to be 501c3 nonprofits, and they also have to be based in the District of Columbia. Uh, our, uh, you know, kind of like standard um, uh, eligibility requirements in terms of registering with DC government agencies. So the organization that you're applying through has to, you know, have a business license with DCRA. They have to have uh, the ability to obtain a clean hand certificate from the Office of Tax and Revenue. Um, if necessary, it would have to, you know, file with DOES uh, for all the employment requirements there. Um, unlike other uh, organizations, we're not actually asking for um, a lot of proof up front for these things. Uh, but you do, when you apply, have to certify that your organization complies with all of these uh, agency requirements. Uh, for individuals, uh, the minimum age is 18. Uh, you have to be a legal resident of the District of Columbia 
And the key thing to remember, as I kind of alluded to before, is that if you get the funding as an individual, you have to be responsible for reporting that grant income on your tax returns, which uh, is uh, a good reason for applying through an organization if uh, you're at all able to do that. Uh, all applicants, whether you're an organization, applying as an organization or an individual, must not hold any other open grants from Humanities DC. 100% of your project must focus on Washington, D.C., and it all must occur in, within the grant period. Uh, the grant period is fairly short for this project. Uh, the um, grant awards will be announced at the beginning of March. The grant period will officially begin in mid-March, uh, most likely March 12th. Uh, that same date is that first of the um, grants technical workshops. Um, and all the funding for the grant must be spent by September 30th. So between March 12th and September 30th of 2020, all the expenditures on the grant must go out. I have one question, taking any question. Um, you said it has to be a DC resident. Yes, that's pretty cut and dry. No, no DMV, no DC, Maryland, no Virginia, anything like that. If you're in Prince George's County, you can't, you don't qualify. Uh, unfortunately, yes, yeah, since um, this is kind of a new requirement for us. Uh, since these grants are being funded, uh, you know, almost 100% with district government dollars, um, most of it actually coming now from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, uh, we do have to comply with their regulations for funding. And one of their requirements is that all grantees must be DC residents or the organization must be based in DC. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of uh, leeway we can give on that at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, and you just said, or the organization must be based, as opposed to every individual that's in the organization has to be a resident. Is that what I understood you to say? That, that's correct. So yeah, if you you know live in Maryland, but you're applying through a DC-based organization, there's no problem with that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and so uh, just a couple of slides here that talk a little bit about how to access and log into our grant application portal. Uh, this is the page that you see when you first log on to the portal. And I'll put the URL for how to get here up um, at a, on a later slide, but it is grantapplication.wdchumanities.org if you just want to write that down now. Uh, and you would only... Could you read that? Sure, it's grant application, all one word, dot wdchumanities.org. Okay, thank you. And there will be a slide that has that on here uh, towards the end as well. So if you missed it there, you'll be able to get it a little bit later. Um, but once you go there, you'll be taken to this logon page, and you would only create a new account here if you believe that you or your organization has not already applied for a Humanities DC grant. So if your organization's already applied, you wouldn't want to create a new account. Uh, if you're not sure what the credentials are for that uh, organization, you would just want to give us a call, uh, send us an email, and uh, we'll let you know kind of how you can access that organization's uh, section within the grants portal. But if you're confident that you and your organization have never applied for a Humanities DC grant before, uh, you would want to create a new account and for the purposes of most of these questions, even if you're applying as an individual, you would want to kind of think of yourself as an organization. So, you know, for example, one of the things that the um, portal requires that people put in is an EIN or tax identification number. Um, obviously, if you're applying as an organization, you'd want to use the correct EIN for that. If you're applying as an individual, uh, you have to put something in there. So we just recommend you put all ones in as a placeholder. All right, and once you have that information, um, you put in the information for who the project director is going to be. Uh, it'll ask you if you're the organization's executive officer. Uh, if you are, then that's fine. If you're not, then it's also going to ask you to put in information for the executive officer. All right. And then once you've done that, it'll ask you to create a password, and then you've created a new account within the system. And the first thing it'll take you to is the applicant dashboard. And in order to see the applications that are available, 
uh, you click on the apply button that it would be right up here at the top. Uh, one thing that I note at this point is that uh, the uh, this is the portal portal for all of humanities DC's grant um, opportunities and there are uh, quite a few of them that are available right now. Uh, and it can also be a little bit difficult in the dashboard to discern between the new projects, the public projects, and the extension grant. So when you get to um, the listing of uh, opportunities that are available, you just want to be really careful to make sure that you're applying for the one that you mean to apply for. This is kind of what the listing looks like. It's a uh, you know, big list and it has pretty extensive descriptions of each one of the opportunities. You can see here in this slide that in parentheses next to DCOHC 2019, it says for public projects or events versus new oral history projects. And again, you just really want to make sure that you select the right one so you don't start filling out an application and find out later that that's not actually the uh, application that you wanted to um, sign up for. Um, and within each one of the descriptions also has a link to the full RFP. Um, you know, probably even before you get to this stage, but you know, definitely at some point before you start applying, you want to download those full RFPs, and they are available on our website as well, uh, just to make sure that you're meeting all the qualifications, all the eligibility, and you kind of know what the application is going to ask you for. And when you're ready, you click apply in the right corner there, and then it'll take you to the application. I'm going to exit the uh, presentation for a second, and we'll actually go uh, to the portal. Let me make sure that the audience view is switched. Yeah, so everybody should be able to see the uh, applicant preview of the application right now. Uh, once you click apply, this is where it'll take you. And the application, uh, this is the new project application. They're set up in blocks. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit, you can see that there are a number of different groups of questions here. Uh, this one has just very basic information. Uh, we want to know the humanities discipline that will be covered. In most cases, for oral history projects, it will probably be history, but you have the opportunity to select, um, you know, other uh, humanities disciplines as well if you feel like they qualify. Uh, you also want to select at this point whether or not you're applying as an organization or an individual. In the next block, it will ask you some questions about your organization. There are also instructions for if you're applying as an individual. Right now, we don't have branching questions in the application, so everybody sees the same question, whether or not you're applying as an organization or an individual, but there are, there are alternative instructions for people who are applying as an individual. So, for example, you know, if you're an organization, you'll give us what the annual budget for the organization is. If you're an individual, you can just write zero, and that way you can kind of move forward with the application since all of these questions are required. Um, the last question in this group, is uh, is your organization serving solely as the fiscal sponsor? Uh, there's a section in the RFP that details what a fiscal sponsor is and what the qualifications for that are. Uh, but if you are, uh, you know, working either as an individual or as an organization that doesn't have 501c3 nonprofit status, you are actually able to go out and find a sponsoring organization that can serve as your fiscal sponsor, who can take kind of financial responsibility for the grant funds and sign off on the application and be um, kind of supportive in that way. Um, and if that's what you're doing, you would want to make sure that you're applying as that fiscal sponsor. You would want all the organizational information that you input here to be representing the fiscal sponsor. And then you would also want to get a letter, letter of support from that fiscal sponsor, um, just kind of indicating that they do support your project and they're willing and able to accept the funds. Uh, the next block is the uh, project summary, and it's where you're going to outline the different roles, uh, the actual kind of staffing roles for the project. Uh, we ask for a brief summary, um, just a, no more than 1,500 characters, 250 words for that brief summary. You're going to have plenty of opportunity later in the application to describe it in more depth, uh, but information again about the project director. And then uh, information in this new project um, grant about the bookkeeper. And the key thing to remember about the bookkeeper, and this is the person who's going to keep all the records, uh, financial records for your program, is that it has to be somebody who's uh, different than either the project director or the sponsoring organization executive. The biggest block is going to be the project narrative. Uh, this is kind of the meat of the application. Um, and this is the section that the grant evaluators are really going to be scoring. 
Um, we have, as we mentioned before, that question about your area of interest or research topic, uh, an opportunity to provide a timeline, an estimation of how many oral history interviews you're going to uh, collect. Um, we ask you to define how your project will contribute to the history of Washington, D.C., how you envision the public using the project. Uh, collaboration, that's both in terms of the people who are on your team and any partner organizations you're bringing in. Uh, as I kind of mentioned before, we're looking for a description of how you'll engage the community that you're going to be working with. And that's not only interviewing them, but it's also how are you going to actively engage the community in uh, the development and the carrying out of the project itself. Uh, also, as we mentioned, um, we're really interested in developing these grantee cohorts. Um, so, you know, we want uh, everybody who receives a grant through DCOHC to support their fellow grantees, to share information, to kind of build this community of practice around uh, oral history in the city. Uh, and then uh, we have a question that, um, you know, I'm really always careful to say here. We say we want to know about your familiarity with oral history best practices, but in no way uh, do we require a certain level of familiarity. So you don't have to be an expert. We just want an answer to this question. So as Maggie and Anna go back and they start to develop the training, they can kind of get an idea of where everybody's coming into it and what their initial skill level is. And then finally, we asked for a marketing strategy for the project as well. Uh, it's you know, always important that as you're doing these oral history projects, you think about how you're going to share the information you collect back with the community you're collecting it from. Uh, so we ask you to give us a little bit of information on uh, what your plans are for that as well. Um, there's a section to provide appendices, anything that might support your project, like letters of support from collaborators, any examples of past work, if you have an illustrated version of your timeline that you think could help the evaluators, uh, those things can all be included here in the appendices. Uh, the budget is a very important point. Um, there's actually a link within the question here uh, where you can download our budget sheet template. Uh, we do um, ask that you use that budget sheet template and not create a separate one. And once you download that, you can fill it out and then you can click here to upload it back into the system. A uh, key thing to remember is that this text box is actually for your budget narrative. Uh, sometimes people forget to put a budget narrative in there. It's very important to go back in and to um, go through that budget sheet and use this box to identify more um, kind of explicitly where the funding is going to go. So, you know, for example, in the budget sheet, one of the rows is for um, personnel costs. You know, who are you going to bring in? Who are you going to pay? either salary, wages, consulting fees to, um, but we only ask for the number on the budget sheet. In the budget narrative, we actually ask you to go through and be a little bit more specific about who you're going to bring on and pay out of that category. Um, the last piece, um, this is also new for this year, is we ask you to provide us a little bit of information about how you're going to make the project accessible, and this is specifically around ADA compliance and making sure that uh, you know, the project itself is as accessible to uh, as many people as possible. Um, this is, you know, a little bit different for oral history projects since, you know, in large part, um, especially for the new projects, you're primarily going to be working with your narrators on completing the work. But um, this is where you would provide information about um, any accessibility plans that you or your organization might have, um, current accessibility status, and then certainly uh, this third question, which is labeled as accessibility for presentations, that can either mean presentations where you're sharing back to the community or it could mean the actual practice of collecting the oral histories. You know, what are you going to do in those instances to make sure that either the information is as accessible as possible or that from a standpoint of mobility, the locations that you're working with are as accessible as possible. Um, I should also note that the ADA compliance questions are not scored by the evaluation panel. Uh, but we do ask that you complete them uh, for the purpose of compliance. Um, the final section is the certification and e-signature. The application is all done within the portal. There's nothing you have to print out and sign and send back to us. Uh, what you put into these boxes constitutes an e-signature. And once you've completed that, uh, you would be able to click the button at the bottom to go ahead and submit. Uh, you can't really see it in preview mode here, but at the bottom, when you're actually filling out the application, 
Uh, as soon as you in input anything into the application, you'll have the ability to go to the bottom and save it. And that's important because, you know, you might not want to just like fill this all out in one sitting. You might want to kind of take it over time. You might want to, you know, kind of schedule it out uh, throughout the rest of the time before the, uh, before the deadline. So um, you can always save by clicking that box at the bottom and you can come back to it at any point. Uh, and so that's it for the new projects. Um, you know, I'll kind of say in advance here that the extension grant application is very similar. The major difference for the extension grant is that uh, we also ask um, why it's important that your grant be extended or that your project be extended. Um, but it would be more important at this point to go back and uh, take a quick look at the public projects grant because that's the one that's significantly different from the new world history projects. Uh, so let me pull that up really quick. Um, uh, a good, good, good part of it is very similar. Um, first major difference is at um, uh, the project roles. There is a spot here where you uh, input information on humanity scholar. Um, you know, again, that person doesn't have to have particular credentials, but you do have to upload their resume and the information that you put here and in the project scholar question a little bit later in the narrative should indicate that they are qualified to serve as your project scholar. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the project narrative here. Uh, we asked for a uh, project description. We actually, actually asked for a description of the oral history interviews uh, the project will be based on. Um, you know, and again, we have a very large warning here to make sure people are aware that this is not the grant for collecting new oral history projects. We had a few people last year who um, kind of uh, were confused about which one of the um, programs they should apply for, and they ended up applying to do new oral histories through the public projects grant. Uh, that's not what we're looking for here. You have to identify existing oral histories that you're going to use for a public humanities project. <clears throat> Here's the box where you would input uh, how your humanities scholar will engage and what their qualifications are. Um, and then um, one of the you know, other big differences is that uh, you'll uh, fill out this question um, telling us kind of what that record of the program for education and research will be, what will be that tangible final product that's added to the DC Digital Museum. Uh, beyond that, much of the application is the same. We ask for a marketing strategy. We ask for how you're going to participate with the cohort. Uh, the last major difference is um, in the um, evaluation. Uh, for the new projects, we're not asking for um, a description of how you'll evaluate. Uh, for the public projects grant, since it is kind of a public-facing grant, there's you know going to be some audience data that's collected. Uh, we want to make sure that um, you are uh, providing some sense of how you're going to evaluate the impact that that uh, public project will have. Uh, the budget is uh, the same. It's the same budget sheet, same way to upload the file and input the narrative into the box, the same accessibility questions, and then the certification is the same as well. So that um, you know pretty much concludes a little brief tour there of the application. Um, are there any questions about that that have come up? I know that's a ton of information to get all at once. If you, you know, have a question right now, please ask. If it takes you a little while to think of it, we'll definitely be available uh, later by phone or email to answer questions as well. All right. Um, yeah, and again, I know it's a lot to take in all at once. So, you know, definitely take a look at your notes when you get home. Um, you know, let us know if you think of any more questions. And as Maggie mentioned, um, definitely reach out to her as well. And uh, uh, she'll definitely be there to talk through your project ideas with you. Um, I mentioned this at the very beginning of the presentation. There are a couple of other ways to get involved with the DC Oral History Collaborative. Let me go full screen on this really quick so you can see it a little bit better. Um, we are, um, you know, we do uh, three of the volunteer training sessions. They're very much like the grantee training sessions that you would experience if you were awarded the grant, uh, but there are sessions that are free and available to the public as well. Um, I don't believe those are scheduled for 2020, um, but if you kind of keep in contact with DCOHC, uh, the contact for those uh, workshops is Anna Kaplan and her email address is here. 
she would also be the person to reach out to about the collection survey, which actually has a separate tip uh, email address there. But if you're aware of an existing oral history archive uh, that maybe nobody knows about, or it's you know maybe it's a private collection, uh, please do let us know about that because one of the missions of ZCOHC is to organize information about um, oral history collections related to the city, uh, no matter where they may be. Uh, that is the end of the webinar. As I mentioned, uh, you know, end of it, have a contact slide. We have the URL to how to get to the grants portal there. DCOralHistories.org is um, at present the website for the collaborative. If you go to DCOralHistories.org, you'll see all the existing grant opportunities. You'll be able to download all of the RFPs in full. Uh, please do follow us on our social media. Uh, we always have new information about workshops that are coming up. Um, you know, opportunities that are available to the public, uh, and we definitely hope that we, um, you know, hear more from, from you, whether it's through a grant application or uh, through some other means. Are there any uh, any other questions? I know we're kind of reaching the end of our time here. That really a question. Uh, somebody on your side, uh, Calvin, I think it was, mentioned uh, his interest in Penn Branch. Hello? Uh, Yes, um, trying to see, um, I think that oh, yeah, was, uh, that was me. Yes. Oh, yeah. hi, hi, Kelvin. Maybe I can um, exchange information with you. If that's okay to do that over this uh, webinar, because that's, that's, that's my area of interest. And that's what I uh, research on, on a regular basis with my website. Um, in fact, I belong to a group called, I grew up in Penn Branch on Facebook. And yeah, I know that group well. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I'll uh, put my email in here. Okay. Um, okay. How will I get it? <laughs> uh, can you see the um, the chat window? Uh, here you go. Oh, sweet. Okay. <clears throat> oh, it's open. He's typing. Oh, yeah. okay. He's typing. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There you go. All right. Thanks a lot, Kelvin. That's in mind. Uh, okay. Okay. So how do I do it? Just type in. I mean, uh, um, she had mentioned that there would be opportunities to possibly partner. Uh, when I heard the one on the radio, is this opportunity still available? It sounds like things have changed a lot. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it does sound like things have changed a lot. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, exactly like if there's any kind of like formalized partnership opportunities outside of, you know, these grants, which, you know, of course we consider kind of partnership opportunities in and of themselves. Uh, do you have any kind of like specific arrangement in mind or was there any elaboration on the radio, well, radio ad as to what that? One of the things that I heard was uh, if you did your oral history, then probably there, there would possibly be someone else doing the audio and the recording and would be able to partner with you uh, and that they do assist you and help you through the steps. Um, trying to, I, I, yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think we have any a formalized way of doing that necessarily. I think, uh, you know, kind of maybe given the opportunity to, you know, think through your project with you, like, you know, especially like now that we've done this for a few years, there's a chance that we might be able to kind of connect people with organizations that have similar interests, or, you know, we might be able to um, connect new grantees with people who have been through the process before that might be able to provide some additional information or might be able to provide some mentorship. Um, do you have any thoughts or ideas about that, Maggie? Um, I think your suggestions are great. I mean, in the next year, we're also going to be working. So the term volunteer training is a little confusing. So if you go to our volunteer training, you're actually qualified to do two different things. One is to collect interviews about something you are really passionate about and really care about and get them archived just like all of the projects that get grants do. The other thing it gives you the opportunity to do is to help other people or to interview people who are really important in the city. Um, so if you were, for example, that knew of people who needed to be interviewed, we could potentially 
match volunteers who've gone through our training to help get that done. We're still getting that part of it off the ground, but that's our goal. Great. So I need to contact you because I definitely want to be a volunteer and sign up for your training. Did I hear him correctly when he said there's not a training schedule for 2020 and he doesn't know if there will be? We don't have it scheduled yet, but there will be training scheduled. So just check back with us like early next year, January, um, January, February, and those will all be scheduled. And also if you follow us on Facebook, we'll post everything there too, definitely. So can I send you my email and my interest in being a volunteer or should I just wait until you post something on Facebook? What is your preference? Um, if you want to put, yeah, put your email in the chat, we'll make sure we pass that on to Anna, um, who runs the, the trainings, and we'll also, um, happy to talk to you more if there's something other than just sort of the general training that you're interested in. Um, we can try to think of a good way to utilize your interest. And Matthew, if you don't mind, take down my email address as well. I'm interested in training too. My name's Craig. Awesome. Thank you. It's exciting. <laughs> Genuinely. Um, well, hopefully there'll be some more questions and we won't, uh, you know, this won't be the last that we hear from you. If you, uh, you know, have anything as you're going through the application that you need a little bit of help on, please do contact Maggie or I. Uh, and, you know, as Maggie mentioned, if you just want to kind of talk through your project idea and, you know, find out a little bit more how to kind of improve your application, uh, Maggie is available to help with that as well. Um, Thank you very much again to everybody at the Anacostia Library. Uh, yes, thanks for thank joining you. us. You know, I know that it was um, kind of a confusing thing that happened there, but I uh, definitely appreciate you all sticking with us and joining us on the webinar today. Thank you very yeah. much. My, my email address is in the RFP. Um, so yeah, please reach out the sooner the better and I can talk to you multiple times as you work on your applications if you decide to go for it. Um, so yeah, great to hear about everyone's interest. Really exciting and looking forward to getting to know all of you better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.